Today's participants are Robin Roberts, and Key Francis. We join the conversation in the Faculty Lounge. Where were the auditors? And Mm -hmm. What were they doing, and why weren't they doing their job? And right. so I think it's this. Uh, it really is a, a job in my auditing classes. For example, I talk about uh, auditors as needing two characteristics: they have to be competent and trustworthy. Mm -hmm. Competence means they understand all these intricate rules, you know, and can apply those rules in different situations. And mm -hmm. trustworthy just means that you know third parties who are looking at their reports can uh, rely on them to tell the truth about what they found and uh, it's you know it's a requirement of a profession that sort of is built on selling its integrity and when that's what you're selling and, and you mm -hmm. sort of get that question then you find it in the newspapers all the time uh, yeah well I yeah. think you know the whole idea of ethics I think springs back to the sort of the golden rule mm -hmm. do unto others as you would have them do unto you sure. and I think you know when you when you begin to build on that there's yeah. you know I, I gave that some thought mm -hmm. when we were talking uh, sure. About what is the other? Uh -huh. You know, is the, is the other? Uh, uh, how do you determine who the other is in a business? Mm -hmm. uh, and how does that affect really? Right. They, I know I know you're the yeah. endowed chair for yeah. the Burnett chair, right. and yeah. you, your research is based yes. on a lot of these things. Mm -hmm. And uh, wh where does that go? All right. Well, uh, defining the other uh, is something that really there's quite a bit of research on. One one. Uh, theory that I've used in some of my research is called stakeholder theory and mm -hmm. it, it's it's meant to contrast stockholder theory you know which means that uh, a business needs to uh, be a part of society they need to have a broader set of stakeholders mm -hmm. so you look at stakeholders being the community the employees uh, the ultimate customer uh, not just the investor who's invested the money with you but all of the different parties that sort of help in the survival of that mm -hmm. company, so mm -hmm. uh, and the environment is is a, a, a has certainly has a stake in, in how a business operates, and so um, you know, stakeholder theory and accounting has really become uh, a part of the discipline and, and a way to try to broaden who we call the other, you mm -hmm. know, when we're making business decisions. Yeah. Well, you mentioned you were going to India mm -hmm. That's to right. do some research on different attitudes and That's how. Right. how perhaps different philosophies mm -hmm. come into play in sure. the business and accounting mm -hmm. area. Yeah, I, uh, I have two sort of current projects that are sort of large scale projects that I'm working on. And one is uh, has to do with the outsourcing of uh, business processes. And uh, that seems to be a, a hot topic politically right now. You'll yeah. hear John Kerry and George Bush talk about that. Right. And it really has to do with, uh, again, that search for being as cost minimizing and efficient as a business can be and we found that technology has uh, made you know a person 6,000 miles away just as accessible as a person in the cubicle next door almost and so uh, over the last few years it's become very popular to seek globally the lowest cost providers of some of your business services uh, it used to be textiles now it's mm -hmm. uh, tax preparers uh, information technology specialists, radiologists, mm -hmm. and it really will, I think, uh, have a huge impact on the, the careers that, uh, you know, our children and grandchildren can have in the U.S. So um, there's a balance that I think has to be considered. You know, I, I, I care about the well-being of global society. So I, I want to go hear from these outsourcing firms and the people that work for those, their side of the story for outsourcing. And, and put that in some global business perspectives. Well, I think the academic institutions are uh, in a unique position to look at that with some mm -hmm. perspective. I think, mm -hmm. uh, I know in the arts and mm -hmm. animation industry, yeah. for instance, so there's a lot of outsourcing uh -huh. of animation right. to, to uh, third world countries mm -hmm. and to other countries that are equipped to do that uh -huh. technologically. Uh, and I think it's it's harder to look mm -hmm. at that mm -hmm. in a fair way if you're not in a in an academic right. institution. It's mm -hmm. almost too close to home to get a perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, do you feel that going there mm -hmm. 
uh, from an academic institution yeah. and writing about this mm -hmm. in your papers and things from an academic yeah. point of view is yeah. maybe a little bit ahead of the times over uh, yeah. the, the cultural perspective? Um, uh, I would hope so. You know, I mean, that's uh, <laughs> sort of, I'm, I'm trying to advance knowledge, you know, now right. this is social science knowledge and there's always a, a political perspective, I think, to much of what gets gets done. Uh, the, one of the reasons that I was motivated to do the work was there was some uh, sort of local outsourcing that took place with some of the large corporations mm -hmm. located in Orlando and students that we were graduating out of the School of Accounting were uh, ending up losing their positions as these companies outsourced their jobs. And I thought, you know, just sort of personally felt worried and concerned about those students. Then I talked to uh, a colleague from India and he talked about all the wonderful things that were happening to the people there as a result of having these jobs outsourced. And so trying to understand it globally, how can we help you know, provide better lives for uh, our own citizens and for other citizens uh, around the globe? Well, I think you know, to an, an uninformed person, mm -hmm. I, I think the idea of, of going to college to learn accounting mm -hmm. probably doesn't take into consideration the the philosophical and social and political courses that mm -hmm. one would be required to take and that mm -hmm. most of your majors probably do take as electives. You want to uh -huh. sure. tell me a little bit about the, mm -hmm. how those two things yeah. work? Well, it's uh, um, there is a huge technical component you know, to accounting, and I think people that come into accounting, I always say that uh, some of our best students are the ones that uh, decided not to be engineers. You know, I mean, they, <laughs> right. they have this very great predisposition to work with numbers and they like numbers and mm -hmm. in accounting you just put dollar signs in front of them and right. some, work some different equations uh -huh. but then when they get into the subject matter uh, they start realizing how much judgments involved uh, you know you've heard jokes you know like you know what to you ask the CPA what's two plus two and they say what do you want it to be you know <laughs> and uh, you know you realize then uh, the the ethical side and the judgment side of, of that uh, right. when I teach my undergraduate auditing class uh, one of the first things I do is I actually put up a uh, drawing that my daughter made when she was four years old and I asked the students to describe what it uh, what they're seeing you know and they of course she was small so they have a lot of trouble trying to figure out but then they come to this conclusion that you know, someone was sick, and there were flowers by the bed, and you know, and so then I, uh, the next thing I put on the transparency is a balance sheet for Walmart. You know, I mm -hmm. say, okay, now what is this picture trying to tell? You know, and then I, I point out that you uh, take a company like Walmart, and you know, billions of dollars, hundreds of locations, and it's the job of the accountant to boil it down to, you know, three really three sheets of paper: a balance sheet, an income statement, and a statement of cash flows that condenses mm -hmm. everything they did you know, into three sheets, and that it's uh, as much of an art as, as it is a science. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, well, I think one of the great things about being at an academic institution is I think the preconceptions you have about professions mm -hmm. and training and uh, a, a variety of skills mm -hmm. is that you, you find that uh, most of those preconceptions are uh, just that. They're preconceptions sure. and mm -hmm. don't, aren't really based in reality. Mm -hmm. I mean, certainly artists get the, <laughs> you know, get yeah. nailed for, for not being very good with money. Yeah, right. And the ones that survive are very good with money. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, accountants, I think, you know, you have the idea that they're not uh -huh. uh, very astute when it comes to to humanity issues, mm -hmm. and sure. humanitarian issues, things mm -hmm. like that. But yeah. I but I think you, you, when you get in an institution you, and you actually have time to meet with people, you find yeah. they have wide ranging interests. Mm -hmm. sure. uh, your students that come in generally, uh, do they, do they come in with a wide ranging group of interests and then you have to yeah. help them get focused or, mm -hmm. or is it really more an ex expansive uh -huh. process? Right. Um, it's basically uh, the first year of, let's say, a PhD program in accounting has to do with uh, introducing the student to really the uh, different research methods that are available. Usually there's like, accounting research spans three different root disciplines, what I call them. There's uh, the economic discipline, which where people study like changes in the prices of stock and how accounting information impacts mm -hmm. the stock market. Uh, then there's a bulk of research in psychology that looks at how accounting is used to help people make business decisions and mm -hmm. kinds of like, you know, uh, anchoring and adjustment problems or cognitive biases that people have, why they might, you know, spend good money, 
you know, chasing bad, you know, they ignore sunk costs or something like that. And mm -hmm. then there's also a, a, a sociology or political science side that looks at, uh, you know, how society and accounting sort of go hand in hand in terms of, you know, things like taxation, public policy, and things like that. And the students usually come into this program thinking, uh, boy, you know, I want to teach accounting. You know, there's, they, it's not like chemistry where they've been in the lab ever since they took their first chemistry class. Mm -hmm. No, they spend a lot of time learning those institutional details, the mm -hmm. principles and the auditing standards. And so it really is an expansion is, is what happens that first year. Do you think the students are primarily uh, more extroverted or yeah. generally introverted uh, people? Uh, how, how? You, you know, uh, you think about an accountant probably being an introvert, that uh -huh. they, they like to sit at their cubicle at the desk with the numbers. And the, uh, I found that it's, it's uh, you know, often that the student that comes back and they say they want to teach accounting, it's actually because they have a little bit of extrovert in them mm -hmm. and they've missed being with people, mm -hmm. interacting with people. It's the front of the classroom is about as close to a stage as they, as they get. And so that seems to be part of the excitement that, that drives them there. Uh, the other thing that you find is that they're almost all very curious. You know, mm -hmm. they're, they're, they come from their work lives with all these questions. You know, that, uh, you know, you know, I kept wondering why, you know, uh, 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 my business manager you know, kept wanting me to perform this task. Or I remember how everybody felt when uh, they were given a revised budget that was much tighter than, than they needed to accomplish what they thought needed to be accomplished uh, mm -hmm. in their unit. And so those questions end up, you know, driving their, their own research efforts. Which I think brings me to an interesting point, a mm -hmm. question that yeah. I'd like to ask you, yeah. which is I know that a large part of your assignment as the endowed chair mm -hmm. is research. Uh -huh. uh, is that primarily a funded research, or mm -hmm. is that research mm -hmm. that's just driven by your own personal curiosity mm -hmm. and the desire mm -hmm. to expand knowledge? Yeah. Well, I'd say the, uh, it's the second, and that's one of the best sort of aspects of having an endowed chair position is that uh, you know, they attract people into these positions. They set you up not only with your salary, but with some budget funds that allow you to do things like travel to India to interview these executives of these outsourcing firms. And so it really is a curiosity that can drive your research. Uh, there's practical applications to that eventually. Mm -hmm. uh, I've done public policy work uh, that looks at how the uh, public accounting profession interacts with legislators at the state level and at the uh, Congress level to mm -hmm. enact laws about CPA licensing, about legal liability issues. And, and auditor independence issues. And so, uh, you know, uh, I remember uh, during the auditor independence hearings, this was all about Sarbanes-Oxley Act that maybe you hear about. And the phone rang and it was uh, this conference call and it was uh, people who were doing some work for a senator. And they said, you know, we're, we're trying to get a handle on this auditor independence issue. You know, what's this deal? You know, and I thought, well, we should probably know, but I'll, you know, explain. So I told them there are these two theories, a conflict of interest theory, which says, if an auditor's doing a bunch of consulting and getting paid a bunch of money, they could compromise mm -hmm. their independent thinking when they do the audit. Right. And the other theory is what they call the spillover theory, which says if you're doing all this consulting, you get to know the client really well, and you can actually do a better job auditing. Mm -hmm. Well, they, uh, when I mentioned the spillover theory, they said, ooh, ooh, we really, we like that theory. Now that is a good theory. <laughs> you know, uh -huh. and it was your, you quickly knew what, you know, side of the house they were working for right. uh, because there were, you know, particular legislators who were pushing to allow auditors to keep doing their consulting and keep doing their auditing for the same clients. And right. At the end of the day, they, they lost that battle and now auditing and consulting has been separated. Well, I think, you know, in the arts as well and as in the business world, I think mm -hmm. there is the pure, the, sort of the search for sort of a pure aesthetic, mm -hmm. pure knowledge, mm -hmm. yeah. and then there's the applied area. Right. And, I, you know, I, I, I'm happy that there is, there are these endowed chairs mm -hmm. and things that sort of allow people to move things uh, in, a, in a way that's mm -hmm. clear in its focus and, mm -hmm. and is not so aimed at the application yeah. end. Sure. Yeah. Uh, no, uh, that's what attracted me to the position there. Mm -hmm. uh, or, uh, 
there's another sort of endowed chair or endowed professorship position that's really it's not common in accounting but it's more common and those are funded by the profession itself you mm -hmm. know so I really enjoy having an endowed chair that isn't so tightly linked to the profession because it allows me to I think you know be a you know one more step removed from the practicing side of the profession when I'm doing my research would in the in the one that's more closely relied yeah. uh, related to the profession yeah. do they look yeah. at your research and mm -hmm. have input into that in some way uh, there's a, a good side to that and then there's you know a little <laughs> downside to that a, a good side to that uh, is that the firms have historically been very helpful in providing data and in providing uh, participants for your research so if you're going to do research where you want to know how you know does an auditor make a determination about whether there's an irregularity in a financial mm -hmm. report or not, mm -hmm. well then they would actually help line up hundreds of their employees for you to perform these sure. experiments on. And so they, you know, that's been quite helpful. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, you know, I think that there's also, you work closely enough with those firms that it's easy to take on uh, their attitude about their approach to the profession as well. You know, mm -hmm. you just, it's, it's, would be easy to become, you know, an advocate or a sponsor as opposed to an objective researcher. Uh -huh. You know, so uh, that that would be the risk, I think. Uh, so it's it's those are just issues that I haven't had to had to face in, in my particular spot. Well, I'm on the the strategic uh, action committee this year for the mm -hmm. for the university, and one of the things that we're looking at, of course, is we've ex expanded the term pure research and mm -hmm. research to include creative activities. What part of, uh, what part of accounting do you uh, uh, feel falls into the creative activities area uh, of, mm -hmm. of research? Right. Um, well, I think that uh, if, you, uh, if you think about like research as either funded research or as pure research, mm -hmm. there is funded research that goes on in accounting, but not that much. Mm -hmm. So most of it has to do with uh, you know, an individual uh, at their desk with their computer, uh, mm -hmm. reading, thinking creatively about, you know, an issue that they think would be of mm -hmm. interest to them and to others, because eventually you want this published. Mm -hmm. And then you go about solving that sort of curiosity that you have. So that's what always drives me. When I started my work in public policy because uh, uh, I was at the University of Missouri and they asked me to go down to Jefferson City, the state capital, and help with what they call CPA Day, mm -hmm. which all the CPAs converged on the state capital and uh, were going to lobby the state legislators about why we needed new laws uh, that protected our profession. And mm -hmm. So I went in the ballroom there and they brought the Missouri Society of CPA lobbyists up to the podium. This was this stocky old guy with a gray crew cut, a big cigar, plaid coat, double knit pants and I thought <laughs> these people are crazy you know why would you want you know I'm sure he's a great guy but why would you want him representing you know a crowd filled with Brooks Brothers suits right so then we went over to the state capitol and I met all the legislators never seen so many guys with plaid sport coats and <laughs> double knit pants and cigars and uh -huh. short gray hair and then I thought boy they're really smart you know about uh -huh. this and and this must be a very strategic part of uh -huh. our professional license and our professional managing our professional jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. So it was that just sort of simple day of my life that has driven, you know, sort of planted the seed for about 10, 12 years of my uh, research in public policy. Well, yeah. I think, you know, that, that basic idea of a creative activity aspect of this being driven by just a, the need to inquire further into, mm -hmm. you know, information. Uh, is interesting because I have the feeling, you know, I, I think you mentioned that mm -hmm. uh, students that come back for their PhDs uh, still have questions unanswered or they, they mm -hmm. feel like there's something that hadn't been answered right. by the by working in the, the application mm -hmm. ends of mm -hmm. these things and they they're, they wish to inquire further right. into those, mm -hmm. into the big picture. Sure. And uh, I, I think, you know, the idea of creative activity and, and creative end of, of research that's not funded is part of what does finally drive all applied research. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, I'm happy to, to yeah. know that, like I say, the endowed chairs are mm -hmm. one of the things that do mm -hmm. sponsor that yeah. sort of pure research. Yeah. Uh, 
can you tell early yeah. on in a student's life uh -huh. whether they're going to be one of those people with <laughs> continuing uh -huh. inquiries or, right. or whether they're going yeah. to be happy yeah. in, in just the purely applied field? Yeah. Um, you get hints at that fairly early on. I think uh, the one thing that I've done in designing our PhD program at UCF is uh, start out with a course that's called Research Foundations in Accounting. And the whole point of that course, although we cover lots of, you know, the sort of classic literature and things like that, I told them that the one thing that should come out of that course is that they should be excited about one particular area of research that they want to pursue. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's, it's, you know, you get some students who are like kids in a candy store. Mm -hmm. You know, they have this curiosity, but they want everything. And mm -hmm. uh, it's very hard for them to get focused and to actually, you know, put pen to the paper and get on the computer and do what it takes to to focus and get a, a project going that's you know actually doable and, and <laughs> completable within their lifetime, lifetime. Yeah. Yeah, right. you know. and, and then you know and those students are easier to work with than the ones that struggle to find the question you know mm -hmm. then you, you have some who you know just they'll, they'll come in and say you know gosh I just I'm having trouble coming up with a research idea and mm -hmm. those that's the student that I worry about much more because their, mm -hmm. you know, their success is going to be a function of being able to come up with those ideas on their own. Right. Well, I, you know, I, I do think that in some ways being able to phrase a question of, or, you know, come up with a question mm -hmm. in, in both the art end yeah. of things and mm -hmm. in the business end of things is, yeah. is really the challenge. And mm -hmm. to make that, I, I love your yeah. example there, of something they can actually accomplish in their yeah. lifetime. Right. Is, that's another <laughs> another part of right. it. Right. Uh, it, uh, it's amazing. I mean, it seems so obvious. Uh, and, and maybe you had similar, you know, stories to tell about uh, your department. But, you know, it seems obvious that no one's going to get their work published if they don't ever submit it anywhere. Mm -hmm. You know, but, right. you know, you do have people who are so, it's not that they're not hard workers. They, they mm -hmm. have, they're, they're such perfectionists. You know, they, mm -hmm. they see all the flaws in their paper and, and right. they're, they're hesitant to get the criticism. Right. And then, you know, time will pass them, pass them by. And uh, mm -hmm. so, you know, part of, I think, a successful, you know, career in terms of publishing your, your business research is to make sure that, you know, you get it out there, you get, uh, you know, you go and travel to uh, different conferences, go ahead and, you know, take all of the shots that you can take from your peers mm -hmm. uh, and make that work better and then start submitting it to the, to the best journals around. And right. Then you have some confidence in it because it's already right. been shared. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the things I, I think is really interesting is, we, is my opinion of what should occur occur at a university is that people should learn how to learn mm -hmm. and part of that I think is to build and to help a person amplify their particular interest and mm -hmm. learn how to, to pose questions mm -hmm. that will be interesting questions mm -hmm. that will maintain their passion mm -hmm. uh, you know and I think in some ways the culture's attitude of what should go on at a university mm -hmm. seems to be maybe different than that mm -hmm. that we have the answers and that right. we give, we load this information right. in a student and then they right. go out and can find a job. Mm -hmm. And it's more a, sort of a trade school idea right. as opposed to mm -hmm. what is a classic university yeah. idea. And mm -hmm. I, you know, I think the learning to learn mm -hmm. uh, is the most important thing mm -hmm. we do because the, then I think a right. person determines their own yeah. final level. Right. So, you know, the people that you mm -hmm. run into in the PhD program right. are people who've learned to learn and they uh -huh. learn to continue to ask questions mm -hmm. and they ask questions at every level and finally mm -hmm. they ask questions at the MBA right. level and then they, uh -huh. their answers are, have not been right. totally all-consuming right. but, but they know there are more questions right. they have and they yeah. come back at the PhD yeah. level. So uh -huh. I think in some ways I think that's yeah. a, an interesting part of, yeah. of the difference between the perception of the culture right. Right. of what should yeah. happen at, yeah. at a learning institution mm -hmm. and what, uh, what we feel that should right. be occurring here. Yeah, some of the students uh, that I've seen, uh, they they seem to like being a passive learner. Mm -hmm. You know, they like to sit there and, and professors are good at you know standing up at the front and sharing all their knowledge. Right. You know, and so it does take effort to get that learning to learn aspect uh, of uh, education into an accounting classroom. But I think that UCF's done a fairly good job of mm -hmm. that. Right. And then the accounting profession is, in essence, 
sort of technology and time has almost forced that. I remember when I was uh, an undergraduate in accounting, uh, I, I studied, uh, we have what we call financial accounting standards, mm -hmm. and I think we had standard FASB number eight when I was <laughs> an undergraduate. Now we're up to FASB you know, 145 or something like that. Uh -huh. And so the book used to be, you know, one textbook this thick. Now you get two volumes that are about this <laughs> thick. And the credit hours haven't changed. You huh. know what I mean? Because we still, uh -huh. you still have to cram all of that material mm -hmm. into, the, into the curriculum. So it's forced the professors to really, instead of covering the standards, you have to teach students how to learn the standards on their own because mm -hmm. there's too many of them and they're going to change when they graduate anyway. So uh, learning to learn has become, uh, you know, uh, I don't know if I call it a movement, but, you know, but it's become you know, a way in which uh, the accounting disciplines had to deal with just the volume and, and flux that goes on in standard setting. Yeah. Well, since I ran a business, a small business for years, I, you know, one of the things that I think changed for me, I think, was when the, uh, a computer came into being mm -hmm. and, and uh, computer accounting programs became readily accessible mm -hmm. and I was able to, you know, really track right. day by day mm -hmm. what went on in my business. And I, I can see if you're an accountant and, and so much of this that used to totally consume your time mm -hmm. is now done by a machine that's right that it leaves you more time to think about the philosophy of what it mm -hmm. is you're doing and to think mm -hmm. about the you right. know we were talking about the ethics and right. the, the social mm -hmm. implications of it what is. you're doing mm -hmm. I, I think that's got to be good for the yes. profession yeah I think so too there's two things uh, one is we talk about how uh, as a profession we need to we would call it move up a value chain in other words we used to provide a lot of you know standard types of services. You needed mm -hmm. lots of accountants just to handle routine transactions. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. process all the sales orders, all the purchase orders, all the, you know, and there used to be rooms filled with these people. And, and now, you know, that's all done with a click of a mouse. And uh, mm -hmm. so the profession has to, has had to readjust itself into, you know, where it can add more value to, uh, to a business as a service function. Mm -hmm. So we do think a, a lot more.